Good afternoon. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah, cool. Just spent 20 minutes trying to get this mic to fit my fat head. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, they've done a good job. And uh, this afternoon, I want to be speaking about the gift of gentleness. <laughs> and it's funny that I'm doing this talk. I grew up being taught and learning that real men are hard, that real men are, are tough. All my role models were, were men, either in TV or films that beat people, shot people, or blew people up. And my role models in real life weren't much different. From Arnold Schwarzenegger to Sylvester Stallone to Mike Tyson to the local hard case full of steroids, every man I looked up to was hard, was tough, and was rough. The message that I was given as a, as a young man as, and as a child was that being a real man meant that you were hard, that it meant you were tough. And that being gentle was a sign of weakness. It was a sign that you were a victim it was a sign that you were not a real man. Then fast forward 20 years, I'm a grown man, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a pastor. And my wife is constantly telling me that I'm too rough, that I need to be gentle, that I live in a house full of women, not in a bed and breakfast full of tattooed contractors. She tells me that my tone, that my words, that my body language is tough, is hard, is intimidating. She tells me that even when I'm giving compliments, I sound aggressive. <laughs> For years I've dismissed what she's been saying as it must be a gender issue or it's because she's middle class she doesn't really understand me. Then my children started saying the same as my wife. And then other Christians started saying the same as my wife and children. Ian, you come across very hard. You need to learn to be more gentle. And my response to that was, no, I think you need to toughen up. It's not an issue that I'm not gentle. It's that you are just far too soft. <laughs> yeah. Then I start reading the Bible and I see the passages about God being gentle. I see the passages about Christians needing to be gentle, and I thought, do you know what? Being gentle is the least of my worries. Let's deal with my addictions first. Let's deal with the real issues. Let's look for the gifts that matter. Gentleness isn't one of those gifts. Yeah, I passed through those passages. I, I stopped reading those verses until Mez thought it'd be really hilarious to choose me to speak on gentleness. And uh, praise the Lord that he did. I'm so glad that he did because in God's providence, spending time researching what true gentleness is, it's helped me to see my blind spots. It's helped me to see my fears and the lack of trust I have in God, which is preventing me from seeing what true biblical gentleness really is. It's shown me what it is and it's shown me what it isn't. And it's showing me the reasons why many of us fail in uh, portraying a biblical gentleness in our lives. So rather than just hearing what my opinion is on gentleness, let's turn to God's Word in Isaiah 40 and see what God has to say about gentleness. So Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, 
And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their fearfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counsellor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions it, silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will rot. They looked for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is alive and has power. And we pray that through your word and by the power of your spirit, you will encourage us, you will challenge us, and you will equip us to be more like your son, Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, it was a, a, a long chapter. We've just looked at, talking about God, talking about his power and his majesty. Verse 2, we see that God is a God that punishes sin. Verse 5, we hear about the splendour, the grandeur, the majesty of God. Verse 7, we are reminded that we, mankind, are, are like rotten grass blown around by the breath of God. Verses 10, we hear that God is a, a victorious warrior. And verses 12 to the end, we see that the effort needed by God to create the universe was less than a child needs to make mud pies. We hear that the the nations are like dust. 
that we as mankind are insignificant in comparison to him, that we are like grasshoppers in comparison to him. We hear that the universe only exists because of the ultimate power and strength of our God and our creator. We hear that he is eternal, that he is all-knowing, and that there is no limit to his strength, his wisdom, or his understanding. And we also hear that he never gets tired. No matter what he does or what he creates, he has strength to spare that he uses to lift up the weak and the weary. This passage is crystal clear. It's crystal clear in the description that God is majestic, that God is all-powerful, and how insignificant that we are. That the world, that the universe is nothing compared to our God. The power of God is explained to us perfectly in this passage. Yet amongst this power is verse 11. This is the bit where I wait, Maz. <laughs> Verse 11. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Not only do we see that God is supremely powerful, we also see that God is supremely gentle. God is a, a gentle God, and yet he's not timid. He's not weak, and he's far from a pushover. He's not powerless. He's not a victim or any other connotation that I had that I associated with gentleness. God is a gentle God, and that gentleness flows from his almighty power, his almighty might. God's power is supreme Yet that power is supremely controlled. As a child, I used to love watching wildlife programs. And my favorite documentaries on wildlife would consist of either crocodiles or sharks. I used to love seeing these mighty beasts tear other animals apart. I remember watching one documentary about a group of crocodiles waiting for the wildebeest to come along. And they would just pull them apart limb by limb. Then the next scene, we saw these mighty crocodiles just slowly going through the river with their young children in their mouth. That mighty mouth that was used to tear wildebeest from limb to limb was also used to gently cradle their young ones. A mouth with immense power being used to care for their young. Like God, these crocodiles gently control their power to protect and provide. Since being a child, I've confused being gentle with being weak. Yet the Bible shows us that gentleness is rooted in power. I saw gentleness as something to be mocked and avoided, yet the Bible tells us that it is something to be praised and desired. And the reason is, is because gentleness is attractive. If we look at verse 11 again, it says, he tends to his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Lambs are cute little fluffy things, but they're useless and they're pointless and they can't look after themselves. Even crows will attack them and peck out of their eyes. They can't do anything for themselves. They're not bright. They have no defenses. They can't run away. Uh, they can't avoid danger, and they've got no cunning. They cannot protect themselves using any form of strength. They're extremely vulnerable to any type of predator. That is why they need a shepherd. A shepherd. Uh, in, in Britain, the, the biggest problems for lambs is, is crows pecking their eyes out because they can't defend themselves. But in Israel at the time of Isaiah, there was wolves, there was lions, there was huge birds of prey which would have attacked these lambs and killed them. That's why they needed a powerful, strong shepherd to defend them. To survive, lambs need a shepherd. A shepherd that is powerful enough to protect them from their predators. 
Yet they also need a shepherd that is gentle enough to care for them, to care for their other needs, to comfort them by feeding them, by providing them with uh, water, by protecting them from the elements. A good shepherd will make his lambs feel safe and secure. They will be safe from predators. They will be protected and they will be provided for. And this is exactly how God describes himself to us. He says that he tends to his flock, that he cares for his flock, that he gathers them. And he does this by holding them close to protect them. He holds them close to his heart so that he can love them. And he gently leads them. God is gentle. He has controlled power. A power that he uses to protect and comfort his people. Many of you know my story that I was raised without a father. And the biggest thing to affect me when my dad left was fear. I remember going to a British Steel Gala, which was held every year. It was a, a fair to celebrate and reward the workers who worked for British Steel. It would involve a lot of fun for the children and a lot of beer for their fathers. And I remember one particular day walking through the fair and my dad fighting two men at the same time. And my dad, my dad won that fight. My dad had big, strong arms and big, strong fists, and he used those arms and those fists to intimidate other men and to punch their heads in. What caused fear to those men brought protection and comfort to me because I knew those arms and fists would only be used to protect me and to comfort me and never to hurt me. So when my dad left my home, I felt vulnerable and I felt afraid. I knew that my mum was there and she'd do her best to protect me, but she never had the power that my father did. And for many of us in our context, not everyone will have positive examples of power, especially that power being used to protect you. Many of us have seen power used to hurt and abuse us. Many of us have witnessed the type of power that is ungodly, the type of power that brings pain, the type of power used for abuse. Yet a godly power is gentleness, and that gentleness is attractive to other people. It's attractive because it brings protection and comfort to others. And that is the type of gentleness that we as individuals and as church should be displaying to our members and our community. And the type of gentleness that is perfectly displayed by Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus, the King of kings and the, the Lord of lords, came from heaven. He left his throne, his majesty, and came to earth. He came as a man, a, a humble man. A man who says, come to me, and I will give you rest. He doesn't demand that we bow down to him. He doesn't demand our worship. He says to us, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus was originally speaking to the Jews and he talks about the yoke that was used to control the cattle that were plowing the fields. It was a heavy, cumbersome uh, wooden gadget which caused uh, pain that weighed the animals down and, and dictated where they would go. And what he's doing is he's saying that when you try and find the forgiveness from God, when you try to make up for your sin before God, you will be weighed down. Like this heavy yoke, your sin will weigh you down. Your attempts will be futile. Yet if you trust in me, I'll do that for you. That, that yoke that I put on you is light. And when I put that yoke upon you, instead of being weighed down, what will happen is you will find rest. 
What he is saying is that if we trust and, and follow in him, we can know the forgiveness that comes through his sacrifice, that we will get rest from our sins, that we will get peace, knowing that we are forgiven and adopted by God the Father. Jesus is gentle and lowly, and he does the impossible for us. The reason he does the impossible for us, the reason why the burden is light, is because he did what we cannot do. He lived a perfect life in full obedience to his Father in heaven. He died as a, a perfect sacrifice, suffering the death that we desire, deserve for our rebellion and sin and rejection of a holy God. He rose three days later, defeating death and sin, so that if we trust and follow in him, not only are we adopted and forgiven, but we have the hope of eternal life. And he ascends to heaven and he promises to return to judge sin and to gather his church so that we can live for eternity free from sin, free from pain, free from suffering, worship him till the eternity that comes. Jesus used his perfectly controlled power in an ultimate sign of gentleness on the cross. A gentleness which he protects and comforts us by setting us free from the consequences of our sin and giving us an eternal hope and salvation. 1 Peter 2, 23 to 25 says, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he trusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Through all of his suffering, Jesus remained gentle. Through all of his persecution, Jesus remained gentle. Through all of his humiliation, Jesus remained gentle. Perfectly controlling his power to bring glory to his Father in heaven and comfort and protection to his people. And my question this morning is, do you know Jesus as your saviour? Or are you like the sheep that are going astray? If you've gone astray, you need to return today immediately to the shepherd of your soul. And you can come to Jesus because he's exactly as he describes himself, gentle and lowly, desiring to give you rest through the forgiveness of your sins and the hope of eternal life. And if you do know Jesus, we need to ask ourselves, are we reflecting him in that gentleness that he displays to us? Because Christians should reflect Jesus in being gentle. Paul tells us that as Christians, we've been saved for a reason. And that reason is to do good. And that good is to reflect Jesus in his gentleness. Titus 3 says... Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. Then again, he, he gives a similar message to the church in Galatia by saying, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against Against such things there is no law. And again to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 4, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have, lived, uh, you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. If we are worthy to live a life of being called a Christian, we must be gentle. 
If we are going to display the fruit of the Spirit, we need to be displaying gentleness. If we are saved to reflect Jesus by doing good, we must be gentle to everyone. There is no questioning about what Scripture says about Christians being gentle. But we should ask the question of ourselves, that question being, are we being gentle? Because one of the biggest obstacles to us being gentle is our pride. Pride is one of the main reasons that gets in the way of our gentleness. I don't know if any of you have heard of Ronnie Pickering. (laughs) Uh, for those of you who don't know Ronnie Pickering Ronnie Pickering is a man from Hull and Hull is a a tough city in East Yorkshire over five years ago Ronnie Pickering was driving down the street and he got into an altercation with a man riding a motorcycle who happened to have a GoPro camera on his helmet and that camera caught Ronnie Pickering acting like an absolute buffoon. He lost his rag. He displayed extreme road rage. And soon after that argument, that video was uploaded to YouTube and it's been seen around 100 million times already in five years. It was shown on uh, news reports across the world as far away as Australia. (laughs) Ronnie Pickering's anger and lack of gentleness was seen globally. And since this video has gone, violent, uh, gone viral, he's become a laughing stock. He's been assaulted in his local pub. Uh, there's been memes made about him all over social media. And he's even featured on comedy shows like Have I Got News For You. Ronnie Pickering lost his temper and now he's seen as a joke. And as Christians, we need to learn from Ronnie Pickering. Because like everyone was looking at Ronnie Pickering, everyone is looking at us as Christians. They're looking at us to see how we behave and looking at us to see how we respond. And if we ask our friends, if we ask our family, if we ask our colleagues, if we ask our neighbours, what do they see when they look at us? If we ask them, what do they think our temperament is like? Do they say it is like Jesus or do they say it's just like Ronnie Pickering? Ronnie Pickering is seen as a joke and if we as Christians do not display gentleness, we too will be seen as a joke. As I said at the start, I used to struggle with being gentle because I didn't understand what gentle meant. Now I do. Before I was prejudiced about being gentle and I valued other gifts above being gentle. But now I have no excuse. I know how important being gentle is. I now desire to be gentle and I pray that I am gentle. But it's something that I constantly struggle with. Why, if I desire to be gentle Does my wife have validity in calling me a big angry oaf every time something goes wrong? Well, the answer for me and the answer for many of us is the reason we struggle to be gentle is because of our pride. Proverbs 13 verse 10 says, Where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Humility produces gentleness. Pride produces anger. Pride produces anger when we think somebody else has dared to challenge our authority. When somebody else has dared to interrupt our comfort or attack our kingdom. And pride is also at play when we feel powerless. When we react angrily because we feel like a cornered rat and we don't know what to do and we attack out of fear. That again is the result of pride. Pride is our issue whether we think we are the powerful one or whether we think we are powerless. Because in both occasions, neither of us are trusting in the power of God. For any of us to be gentle, we need to humbly trust in the gentleness of Jesus. 
trusting that we are just like grasshoppers and that we are in need of the powerful shepherd who will protect and provide for us. If we want to display gentleness, we need to first display humility in acknowledging that we are nothing and Jesus is everything. And then for those of you who behave a bit better than I do, who don't shout and scream, uh, you don't get out of this either. Whether you're aggressive or whether you display passive aggression, it's still aggression. Since I became a Christian, God has been sanctifying me. When I got angry, I would punch people or I would smash things. But over time, the Holy Spirit has been working on me. Now I just say nasty things or think nasty things and, and I feel better about that. I think, oh, well, I'm not as bad as I used to be. I'm being sanctified and sanctification is good, but what it isn't, it isn't gentleness. Because learning to be polite and biting your tongue isn't gentleness. A few years ago, I was part of a, a social media debate and one man decided to insult another man by using flowery words and metaphors and this other man responded by calling him a knob. <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine who got the flack, who Christian social media thought was at fault. Because somebody had said knob, oh, that was disgraceful, but the man who uh, hid his sarcasm and his, uh, his hatred for his brother in flowery words and metaphor got away scot-free, on social media at least. As Christians, there's a consensus that aggression isn't acceptable and it's far from being gentle. But what about sending out carefully crafted social media posts or emails or gossiping or being resentful? Being passive aggressive is more acceptable in the church, especially in the UK, than being in your face aggressive. But whether you're aggressive and scream and shout or whether you're aggressive and hold resentment in your heart, it's still sinful, it's still aggression. And it's still far from reflecting Jesus in his gentleness. And the root of that is the same of any aggressive. The root is in our pride. But it's not only pride that gets in the way of our gentleness. Fear can get in the way of our gentleness too. Matthew 21, 12 to 13 says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Jesus is gentle, yet he is still angry at injustice and sin. Yet he's never sinful in his anger. He is never aggressive in his anger. He is always controlled in his anger. He turned the tables in the temple. He rebuked the Pharisees. He reminded Pilate that the only authority he has comes from his Father in heaven above. And one day he will come to return to judge and to punish, and to punish sinners. I used to confuse people who weren't aggressive as being gentle. And sometimes these non-aggressive people are gentle, but not always. Sometimes these people are just cowards. Silently standing by, watching injustice, sin and abuse isn't being gentle, it is being a coward. Like pride gets in the way of our gentleness, fear gets in the way of our gentleness too. The Christian requirement to be gentle doesn't require you to be a doormat or to watch people suffer injustice and abuse. Remember Isaiah 40 verse 11. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. God is supremely powerful, yet supremely gentle. And he uses that power to comfort and protect the weak. And we as Christians must do the same. 
We need to stand up for what is right and stand against what is wrong. Trusting in the power of God, acting in love, humility, and self-control. 1 Timothy 2, 7 says, For the Spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. There's a guy called Ian Harbour, and he, and he wrote about this in an article for the TGC, and it says... Gentleness isn't simply the way we respond when provoked. It's the lens through which followers of Jesus are to view and approach the world. As we bring his gentleness to bear on the world, we won't leave injustice and unrighteousness untouched. We will defeat evil by refusing to respond in kind. At times, if we are to be gentle, we will be required to swallow our pride to turn the other cheek and to forgive. Yet other times we will be required to fight our fears, to stand up for those that are being abused and oppressed. Like I said before I started writing this talk, I used to confuse being hard with being strong. I used to see gentleness as as being weak. Yet God's word shows us that through Jesus, I and many others have the wrong interpretation of what it means to be gentle. We've got what it means to be gentle flipped upside down. It's the wrong way around. The Bible shows us that gentleness is a result of humbly controlling our strength to show kindness to others. It shows us that we've been given the gift of gentleness, that if we Christians, that we should have the fruit of gentleness. It shows us that we should be displaying it daily. But it also shows us that if we are to display it daily, we need to take ourselves to the foot of the cross daily. So that we can be reminded that the power behind our gift that the strength behind our gift comes from God and it's available to us no matter how weary we are feeling. We need to come to the foot of the cross so that we are humbled and reminded that it's our pride that gets in the way of our gift of gentleness. We need to come to the foot of the cross to find the courage to fight our fears and stand up for the abused and the oppressed because it's at the foot of the cross that we realise that we have nothing to fear, even fear of death itself. But most importantly, we need to daily come to the foot of the cross to be held close to the chest of the shepherd, to be carried close to his heart, so that we can experience his gentleness for ourselves before taking it to others. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just come before you and we marvel at your might and your majesty, but also at your love, that love that even though we rejected you and turned our back on you, that you sent your son to die in our place, that you didn't leave us or use that power to to snuff us out, Lord. You used that power to give us life through your perfect son, Jesus Christ. And I just pray, Lord, that every day we will go to the foot of the cross, Lord, to deal with our pride, to deal with our fear, to understand the love and power and gentleness of your son, Jesus Christ, so that we can reflect that to one another and to our communities. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.